I like to begin this topic with um, a reference to this article. In her absolutely clairvoyant 1979 article, Barbara Underwood, who is now the Solicitor General of the State of New York, discussed the use of individualized or clinical decision-making versus the use of statistical inference, which is what we would now think of as kind of ML, in what she describes as two different ways of approaching the task of moving from evidence to facts. And she points out that the task presents similar problems, whether the facts to be found are past or future. Now, algorithmic predictors are increasingly being used to score individuals. And as Underwood notes, important benefits and burdens are distributed in society on the basis of these predictors, such as uh, release from prison, placement in schools, uh, jobs, and the granting of retail credit. So that was 1979. Now, the study of the theory of algorithmic fairness was launched in the summer of 2010 at Microsoft's Silicon Valley Research Lab. And we began with definitions because without definitions, we literally don't know what we're talking about. And we identified two major flavors of fairness guarantees that one could ask for. Uh, we called them group fairness <clears throat> and individual fairness. And this dichotomy echoes the statistical inference versus individualized dis uh, uh, decisions distinction that was uh, discussed by Underwood. Now, um, group fairness guarantees are maybe the first thing that you would think of. So they uh, guarantee relationships between certain statistics of uh, decisions or scores about typically disjoint demographic groups um, in the literature. So for example, statistical parity would require that the demographic of the accepted students at your university should be the same as the demographics of the uh, population at large. And balance for the uh, positive class in a scoring function would require that for typically disjoint groups, A and B, the average score for a positive member of A is the same as the average score that's assigned to a positive member of B. Now, group uh, fairness notions fail under scrutiny. So for example, a steakhouse that shows ads to the vegetarians in group A and the meat eaters in group B will still result in a restaurant catering principally to members of B. Um, the hiring of minority candidates may reward sort of more assimilated members of the minority group rather than uh, the less assimilated. And then there's the discussion of which groups should one consider when one is talking about group fairness. And what of intersectionality, what of people who are in two different groups that are uh, traditionally discriminated against. It's also surprisingly hard to test group fairness. It seems like a really simple notion with benchmark tests, but a very compelling uh, article in the Review of Criminology um, by Neil and Winship argues that standard benchmark and outcomes tests typically produce invalid inferences that in their words may diverge from reality in either direction, indicating discrimination when it is not present or alternatively indicating a lack of discrimination when it is in fact present. And then finally, sets of two or three group fairness desiderata can be provably impossible to satisfy simultaneously even for two disjoint, just two disjoint groups, A and B, unless the base rates are the same in the two groups. All right. Now, uh, individual fairness uh, requires that people who are similar with respect to your given classification or scoring task should be treated similarly by the algorithm. Now, that similarly treated Sorry, that similarly situated people should be treated similarly is a pervasive notion in law. And this framework is really powerful and it admits lots of nice math, but 
you need some way of determining for a pair of individuals and the given task, how dissimilar or how similar those two individuals are. In other words, it needs a, a, a similarity metric. And by the way, for this reason, individual fairness is often called metric fairness. Okay. So the need for this metric sort of brought that direction of research almost to a halt for a number of years. But in um, 2018 and 2019, and now some new work that, that's going on um, by some of my colleagues at Harvard, uh, uh, several papers have been um, uh, advancing ways of extracting metric information by interacting with oracles in a not very heavy way. And the intuition is that the oracle is sort of a, a wise person or a wise collection of, pers uh, of people who are um, well qualified to provide meaningful uh, distances. It's a very exciting uh, line of research and I'm happy to see this direction sort of liberated, especially given all of the difficulties. So, but again, individual fairness requires the metric. Group fairness is just broken in many ways, individual fairness requires a metric. All right, so that's where we are. And attempting to sort of bridge this gap between group notions, which are easy to build, but don't really give you true fairness and individual notions, which seem to give you true fairness, but are very difficult to build. Um, a couple of researchers independently suggested a framework that I'm going to call multi-X. So what is multi-X? Well, basically, the idea is to require the group fairness uh, um, desiderata, whatever the condition is, among large numbers of arbitrarily intersecting large groups of, of people. So for example, you might be requiring statistical parity for all sorts of subgroups that intersect in this way. So here, X will specify a specific group fairness guarantee, like uh, parity, or we'll see, we're actually going to favor a different one. And the multi uh, indicates that we're talking about a requirement being applied simultaneously to all sets or all pairs of sets in a pre-specified collection C. Okay. All right. So, um, with that in mind, let's go back to scoring functions. Scoring functions or risk predictors uh, assign probabilities to individual instances. So for example, what is the, when, rather they assign, assign numbers to individual instances and these numbers are often interpreted as probabilities as in what is the chance that it will rain tomorrow? What's the probability that this individual X will repay the loan? What's the probability that this tumor will metastasize? Uh, what's the probability that Y will commit a violent crime? And these numbers can have life altering consequences as Underwood pointed out when we discussed in the first slide. So the problem with this is that it's not clear what the probability of a non-repeatable event actually can mean. So this is a deep question in the philosophy of probability, and there's no settled uh, agreement on this. And I said earlier, without good definitions, we literally don't know what we're talking about. So here we are again, we need to know what are we talking about when we're talking about individuals and saying, this is the probability with which uh, this person you know, will, 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 will have a certain experience and measuring the differences in probabilities that we assign to people when we don't know what the probability means. So we don't know what is the thing that the ideal algorithm ought to be providing. So that's a problem. So here's an example. One approach as you are aware is to sort of group homogeneous individuals together where homogeneous, who knows, similar people together. So we wanna estimate probabilities for individuals by looking at the frequencies 
of a positive outcome with similar people. Um, which again, notice, brings us back to the question of who is similar to whom. But in any case, here's a tumor. And the question is, what's the chance of metastasis uh, of this tumor under a given course of treatment? And all the numbers here are made up. So suppose that one study of tumors looks at, say, these pink locations in the DNA. And for tumors that look like this one on the pink locations, the um, the fraction that metastasized was 0.7. And um, we could have a second study that looks at different locations in the DNA. And it may be that tumors that look like this one on the blue locations have a 40% empirical uh, chance of metastasizing in the study. So first of all, of course, we have no idea what we should conclude about this particular tumor. This is the intersectional case. Um, and, uh, but, but the point that I want to make here even more is that the representation of the individual to the algorithm matters. The choice of features by which we represent people to an algorithm matters. If we used machine learning on the blue features, the blue representations of people, we would come to one conclusion. The pink representations of people, we would come to a different conclusion. So, the way to think about this in terms of fairness is that the choice of features by which we represent individuals is a vector for bias. Okay. okay, so informally, I've now talked about representation. Suppose we have a set X of all possible real people. The algorithm only represents only operates on the representation of the person. It only knows what it's told about you. And typically uh, one might think that distinct individuals would be mapped to the same representation. That's what we saw in our study of the metastasis. But in machine learning, representations are rich. So it may be the case that our representation is so rich that no two people are ever gonna be mapped to the same point in representation space. And that's what we're going to be uh, assuming for this talk. So representations are rich and there are no collisions. Um, so the representation mapping can obscure key information essential for the task at hand. And um, these are my collaborators, uh, Michael Kim, on, on the first part of the work discussed here, Michael Kim, Omer Reingold, Guy Rothblum, and Gal Yona. So you can see we've got full pictures of people, we have their labels, whether they're positive or negative, and then they get mapped by the representation and it, 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 they're still distinct, but key features have been obscured. Okay. Now, I'm going to make a modeling assumption. This is actually not key to any of the proofs. In other words, we could completely dispense with this, but it is key to our understanding of what's going on. So it's a like a vehicle to get us to how we understand things, but none of the theorems rely on it. So what's my model? My model is that there's, uh, uh, there is nature and nature assigns a probability of a positive outcome. So we're looking at just the Boolean case today. Uh, nature assigns to each individual I a probability, a PI star of a positive outcome. So the star will indicate that it comes from nature. And then the actual outcome, the meaning of that is that the actual outcome will be drawn from a Bernoulli distribution that has probability PI star of, uh, of a positive um, outcome. So probability PI star of being one. And since we're assuming that there are no collisions, we can think of P star as also attaching to the representation of X. It's this, we have X over here on the left and then it gets mapped by the representation to Z, but the probability comes with it. There's no collision, so we don't need to average anything. Okay. Now, 
Statistics has a very large literature on the problem of forecasting with the goal of finding probabilities that, so to speak, look right. And so uh, you can think in terms of weather, which is a common example in literature. So you could imagine that every night the forecaster assigns, a, assigns an estimate, a probability of rain for the next day, say 30%, 50% chance of rain. And the calibration requirement says, or criterion says, that if we consider any possible prediction value V, so here V might be say 30%, then a positive outcome, if we look at just the days on which the forecaster predicted V, then on a V fraction of those days, it should actually have rained. So if you look at all the days on which the forecaster said 30% chance of rain, then on 30% of those days, it should have rained. And simultaneously, the same thing for which the for the days for which the forecaster predicted 40%, 50%, and so on. So as I said, this is um, often viewed as a kind of sine qua non of a good forecasting system. If your forecaster is not calibrated, uh, uh, it's considered to be a bad forecaster. Now notice that calibration does not require accuracy. If there were, for example, a kind of limiting frequency, uh, frequency of rain, and the calibrator just said, uh, the forecaster just said that frequency every single day, then indeed, if we look at all of the days which, on which the forecaster said that frequency, which is in fact all of the days, then that would be the frequency of rain. So it's not necessarily all by itself accurate or useful, but um, but still, if you fail to be calibrated, that's clearly not a good thing. So maybe you can think of it as necessary, but not sufficient. Now, I, there is a really extensive literature on forecasting. And um, I'm just going to highlight a couple of uh, examples that, that were kind of went into some of the thinking in this work. So. Um, with profound apologies to Philip David, I'm going to paraphrase what one of his results in a way that he would never say it because he doesn't really believe that nature provides probabilities. But the way we interpret his result is that nature's forecasts are going to be calibrated with probability one. And then Oakes showed that no deterministic forecasting sequence can be calibrated against, uh, forecaster can, can be calibrated against all sequences. And then David, in a beautiful and fascinating paper in 1985, made all sorts of connections that some of which are quite relevant to what we're talking about. Connections to definitions of randomness um, um, uh, and uh, being one of them. Another is uh, arguing that con um, if you have two forecasting forecasters that uh, um, are computable and satisfy a certain strong condition, which he calls computable calibration on a sequence of outcomes, then their predictions will converge in the limit. And then he suggests that this could be a notion of a, what I'm calling individual probabilities. So it's a very inspiring paper. Shervish was not impressed with uh, um, with calibration as a goal. And any, he says, look, calibration is a long run criterion. It can be meaningless in our lifetimes. And um, he has other criticisms of calibration. Then Foster and Vora argued that if you randomize your forecaster and not just look at deterministic forecasters, you can circumvent Oakes's impossibility results. Then Sandroni, Smorodinsky, and Vora showed multi-calibration, which is calibration simultaneously on a countably infinite number of sets. They showed actually how to achieve that. Then Sandroni showed that um, for any test that nature can pass, there's a forecaster that can pass that can pass it as well. And he shows how to how to, how to get such a forecaster. Okay, so lots of interest, some of it uh, uh, becoming almost algorithmic, although they sort of punt to the minimax theorem. Now, the notion of calibration also makes sense uh, for batch. So um, 
you know, weather forecasting is an online problem, but suppose we want to train a predictor on a data set and we want to hope that the results will generalize to previous unseen instances from the same distribution. So we can still ask that the predictions that are made by our predictor, which is going to be called P tilde for the rest of the talk, um, we can still want that the forecasts or the scoring that's done by P tilde will be calibrated. Um, in this example, so cal calibrate, sorry, calibration was first introduced as a fairness criterion, fairness again, by Kleinberg, Moynathan, and Raghavan. Um, and uh, the intuition is that the score should mean the same thing, whether it is assigned to a member of group A or group B. So, when employing the score, one doesn't need to do any second guessing as to what the what it actually means. So, um, uh, in this example, we have the predictions in red squares, and the eventual outcomes in gold ovals, and the predictor is calibrated on the set of authors, but it's not calibrated on either the set of faculty members, um, or on the set of non faculty members. So calibration as a whole does not mean calibration simultaneously on the subgroups. So you have to work to get that. Okay. So going back to the multi-X framework, uh, we have multi-calibration, which was proposed by Aver Johnson, Kim Reingold, and Rothblum. And in multi-calibration, the requirement is that for a possibly very large collection of, uh, uh, of sets of instances, the scoring function will be calibrated on each set simultaneously. Okay. So one question you could ask is, so this, this is kind of nice, which sets, which sets should we be looking at? And if we're thinking just about fairness, um, how should we choose the sets? How can we step outside the box and see that a previously unidentified group has been systematically underrepresented? So we can't require the members of the group to advocate for themselves. Uh, first of all, that requires energy and organization, but also members of such a group may have internalized the false belief of their own inferiority. And the proposal in Eber Johnson et al. is to have the sets be defined via complexity classes. So for example, all sets that can be recognized by a decision tree of height six. And then what you would end up doing is calibrating on each of those sets simultaneously. And so if your minority group can be um, recognized by a decision tree of height six, given the representation of the data, then the algorithm will end up ensuring that um, it's calibrated on that group. Okay, so, so we really like this complexity theory approach because it kind of moves a burden over to the algorithm from the individuals. Now, in multi-calibration, the sets actually play two very different roles. One of them is to capture demographic groups, but the other actually is to stratify, to try to separate out the instances that have high probability of positive outcome from the uh, instances with lower probability of positive outcome. And we're gonna return to this point later. And uh, finally, we're going to note that multi-calibration is not aspirational. That is to say, it, it gets a very fine description of the world as it is, but not the world as it should be. There's no affirmative action here. This is purely descriptive. Okay. Good. So to see what we do with this, I need to uh, introduce you to a key concept, which is um, a complexity theoretic notion of indistinguishability. And if you've heard of pseudo randomness, that's where this is coming from. It's the same 
the same definitional approach as in pseudo randomness. So in a truly random sequence of bits, there's no pattern and the next bit is completely unpredictable no matter how much computational power you have. But in a pseudo random sequence, all we can say is that there is no efficiently discernible pattern and no efficient prediction method without knowing some secret information, which is called the seed of the pseudorandom generator. So typically in cryptography, we require indistinguishability with respect to all polynomial time algorithms or all polynomial size circuits, but the concept is much more general. So we can require indistinguishability by all algorithms that run in less than 24 hours on a 1980s HP calculator, for example. Okay. Pseudorandom sequences are created by a pseudorandom generator that stretches a short, truly random seed to create something that looks random. Okay. So with that kind of vague intuition in mind, let's get a little bit more precise. Just as pseudo-random sequences look random to a given class of algorithms, we want to discuss histories that will sort of look right to a given class of algorithms. And to understand this, we need the notion of a history. So a history is just a sequence of a prediction, say by the algorithm, or maybe not, maybe by nature, but a prediction and an outcome, another prediction, and then what actually happened, and a third prediction, and one ac what actually happened, and so on. So that's all a history is. And then we also need the notion, which I alluded to on the previous slide, of a distinguisher. So a distinguisher, fancy name for a very simple concept. It takes, it's just a program and it takes as input a history and it outputs either zero or one. That's all it does. So you don't see any distinguishing happening yet. This is just what it does. Okay, now, In the language of complexity theory, one might say that the previous thrust in the statistics literature was to find an algorithm, which we're calling P tilde, whose predictions are indistinguishable from nature's predictions. And by that, I mean, we're going to consider two kinds of experiments. In the experiment on the left, we look at histories, which are made up of nature's predictions and then what actually happens. So nature's outcomes, which remember by our modeling assumption are just, this is a probability PI star and the outcome is just drawn from a Bernoulli distribution with, um, with parameter PI star. So that's how these histories are made up. And uh, we could imagine testing, looking at, many sequences of, of this type, and we can see what is the probability over those many sequences that the, uh, uh, the distinguisher outputs a one. And that gives us a simple number. Now in the experiment on the right, we're looking at histories that are composed of the algorithm's predictions followed by what happened in nature. So this is our forecaster saying 30% chance of rain tomorrow. And then we see, did it rain or not? And then the algorithm, the forecaster says 20% chance of rain tomorrow, and then nature makes it rain or not, and so on. So that's a different way of getting your hands on histories. And we can look at a whole bunch of those and say, what's the probability that the distinguisher outputs a one? And then we say, okay, did this distinguisher actually distinguish between histories that are made up with the algorithm's predictions on the right versus nature's predictions on the left, but all the time we're keeping nature's outcomes steady. All right. So we're going to call that prediction indistinguishability because the outcomes are staying still, but the predictor is changing nature versus our algorithm. And if they are indistinguishable, then we'll say to this distinguisher, and we'll write it this way that we have on the left nature's predictions with nature's outcomes. And we have on the right, the algorithm's predictions, but still with nature's outcomes. So the two things in blue are different. The thing in black is staying the same. Okay. So that's our view of what a lot of the statistics literature was looking at. Now, one problem with this is, how do we ever test to see whether our algorithm is indistinguishable from nature with respect 
to you know, prediction indistinguishable from nature for this particular distinguisher. We have the algorithm, we have the distinguisher, but we can never get our hands on P star. In fact, that was just a figment of our imagination anyway. We're not really assuming that nature has a distribution. It's just a way of thinking about things. So we don't have P star, we're kind of stuck. So our approach here is to handle this by shifting perspective, introducing a new notion, which we call, instead of prediction indistinguishability, we're going to call it outcome indistinguishability. So here, what stays the same is the stuff in black again. So we're always handling the using just the algorithm's predictions, but now we're looking at the algorithm's predictions paired with nature's outcomes versus the algorithm's prediction paired with outcomes that are drawn according to the distribution specified by the algorithm. And so, um, uh, we then, okay, so the old view looked like this. The outcomes were from nature and we were looking at what happens with the algorithm versus nature's predictions. Now we only work with the algorithm's predictions and we have either what actually happened or O tilde, the, the sampled from what the algorithm said. And then what we wanna do is design an algorithm that is outcome indistinguishable with respect to a large class of distinguishers D. And it's very democratic in that anyone can suggest a distinguisher, um, which is just a predictor that, um, sorry, anyone can, can, can propose a distinguisher. Here is a distinguisher, please test that your predictions satisfy this. And there's a way of, um, of updating a predictor if it fails to be, uh, if that distinguisher succeeds, we can update the predictor so that not only was it indistinguishable with respect to all of the distinguishers we had before, but also to this new one. Yeah. And this is something that we can definitely test because we have nature's outcomes, that's whether it rained or not on these various days. We have the algorithm's predictions. And because we know the algorithm's predictions, we can draw, we can flip coins that have these biases and get these O tildes. So now we have something that's actually testable. And it turns out uh, constructible. So um, our notion is, of individual probabilities that look right is that outcomes that are drawn from the forecaster's predictions should be indistinguishable from those produced by nature. And this is how we would note it. Okay. Good. So there's a wonderful video on YouTube of a lecture by Richard Feynman in which he talks about how new laws of physics are developed. And first he says, you guess the law, that's where the physics comes in. Then he says, you work out what the consequences should be. So um, uh, you, right, you've got this law, it should predict certain behaviors of the world around you, set up experiments to test whether those behaviors of the world around you in fact, that you, know, that you predicted uh, in, in fact occur and compare the consequences to real life. So uh, if what you predicted disagrees with what actually happened, your law is wrong. He says, it doesn't matter how beautiful it is. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It's just wrong. In that simple statement, he says, is the key to science. Okay. In that light, we think of our predictor as a scientific theory. So if your predictor, for example, is outcome indistinguishable with respect to all polynomial size circuits, then it says that the behavior predicted by the theory cannot feasibly distinguish from the real world, even when you're given access to the predictor, to the predictions. Okay. So there's a very strong motivation to look for outcome indistinguishability. There's no feasible way to falsify such a theory. Okay. Once you frame things in terms of outcome indistinguishability, you realize that you can, like, 
make some fine grained distinctions according to what kind of access the distinguishing test is given to the predictor. So for example, we've been talking about the case where the um, uh, distinguisher is given the prediction PI tilde and the outcome OI tilde. And I redrew the experiment below. But you could also imagine that the distinguisher is given, make, can make calls to the predictor and say, here's an instance J, what would you have predicted there? And, um, uh, and you could imagine even that your distinguisher is given access to the code, the actual algorithm, um, P tilde. So with this in mind, we asked the question of whether we can create outcome indistinguishable predictors whose complexity is independent of that of P star. And in a nutshell, the answer is yes for the lower two levels and no for the upper two levels, at least under some fine grained complexity assumptions. And this level sample access OI turns out to be exactly equivalent to multi calibration. Okay. So here's a consequence for the real world. Um, as I said, the work has its roots in the theory of algorithmic fairness. And going back to the legal system and Barbara Underwood's um, uh, article, once we've defined outcome indistinguishability, sorry, um, what, sorry, getting back to, to Underwood's article, how, what does this do for us when we're like scrutinizing the court system? So California's Proposition 25, which was defeated, was a referendum on a law that replaced cash bail with, um, uh, with automated risk assessment for certain kinds of charges. And the law required annual fairness auditing. So divergence from reality is commonly viewed as unfairness. And what our results show is that an auditor that has access to the code, even if it's only Oracle access and not actually seeing the, the code itself, but the ability to make Oracle calls to the algorithm, um, uh, is such an algorithm is provably better able to detect this kind of unfairness than an auditor that only gets access to the algorithm's decisions on samples from the training and test populations. So this informs what it is that ought to be part of a fairness audit, that you ought to be able, it, it says that you get a more powerful auditor if the auditor can at least make Oracle calls to the, to the algorithm, can ask for the algorithm's outputs on instances of the auditor's choice. Okay, so taking stock, um, we've, you know, is multi-calibration and is outcome indistinguishability, are they giving us um, fairness and accuracy? So first of all, as I noted earlier, these approaches are only to understand what's happening in the real world, which is brutal, not in the ideal world where things would really be uh, where everybody would be able to reach their, their inherent, um, uh, um, ex develop all of their inherent abilities. So there's no affirmative action given by this. Now, in multi-calibration and outcome indistinguishability, both fairness and accuracy depend on richness of the collection C of sets or of distinguishers for the indistinguishability case. But the construction costs, the algorithms um, actually uh, have a factor of the size of C in their construction costs. So if this is a very, very rich collection of sets, it's very, very large, this becomes prohibitive. So one question is whether it's possible to find what I would call a small but mighty collection of sets or distinguishers. So ideally we'd have a collection, which we call a scaffolding set, 
so that if you multi calibrate with respect to this collection, you get a good approximation to P star. So as a Gedanken experiment, if the collection C contained possibly among other sets, the level sets of P star, then um, it would be accurate. So if you have, sorry, if the collection contained the level sets of P star and you multi-calibrate with respect to that collection, then you will actually have an accurate um, predictor that's very close to P star. And if it's accurate, then it'll be calibrated. If it was perfectly accurate, it would be calibrated absolutely everywhere. Okay. So that's kind of a thought experiment. But of course, we don't know how to get our hands on the level sets of P star. We can never actually see P star and so on and so forth. So there is a folk wisdom though, that the intermediate layers of a neural net learn very structured and useful uh, information, the, the structured and useful representation of your individuals. Okay. So following that intuition, we can show that, yeah, sometimes we can, we can find a, a, a scaffolding set, a small but mighty collection C, so that when we multi-calibrate with respect to that collection, we get a close approximation to P, to P star. And moreover, this is true even when P star can't be approximated by the class of neural nets with which we're working. And the particular case in which we're able to really rigorously prove something is when the uh, is when P star can be uh, expressed as the composition of a learnable uh, H star that gives us a low dimensional representation, uh, followed by an kind of arbitrary W star that that uh, only has to satisfy a bounded Lipschitz condition. But this W star may not be expressible in the class of neural nets that we're working with. And this is very recent work with Maya Burhan Porkar, Jun Dong, and Li Jun Zhang. Okay. So uh, last slide. As we've said, uh, this line of work arose in the context of algorithmic fairness. It's descriptive though, and not aspirational. And the philosophy is that we're gonna, like at best, we'll learn everything we can about the real world and then try to adjust in order to make things more fair. And if somehow just the effects of discrimination have a, nice mathematical structure, then there's at least some hope of doing something like this. So um, essentially we imagine a world Q star, which is the ideal world in which everybody can sort of is supported and can reach their full potential. And um, there's this transformation that happens from sexism, racism, poverty, privilege, binarism, and so on, that takes real probabilities in the ideal world to probabilities in the nasty real world. And we never get to see the probabilities in the nasty real world, but we can sample from them. That's what we get when we see, you know, did this person repay the loan or not? We get Boolean labels, so we get samples. Uh, from the outcomes. And we can build predictors that are OI indistinguishable at level two, let's say, from P star. And so we might wonder, is can we get our hands on a transformation tau that kind of goes in the opposite direction? And if so, what you know, takes us closer to the ideal world? And if so, what can we say about tau of P tilde, knowing only that P tilde is indistinguishable from P star? This is a direction of, um, of research that I'm engaging in with Guy Rothblum and, and Omar Reingold. And um, in some cases, there's nothing that you can do, but in some cases, there actually are things that you can do. And those cases have models T that of course aren't really what happens, but 
there's an element that's very believable in them. So I will stop there. Okay. All right. So um, thank you so much, Professor uh, Professor Dwork. Uh, I'd like to open this for uh, questions. And uh, there's a few in uh, the Q and A tab. Um, I'll get started by one by uh, Colin uh, Rowat. And uh, the question is, as the economic literature on uh, social choice, most famously the work of people like Marty Sen, been useful in this debate. One of its Fauci, has been impossibility theorems demonstrating compatibility within sets of axioms. So the uh, the answer is, although it hasn't shown up in this talk and exactly in this line of work, we're we're very aware of those um, those results, and uh, there are some interesting observations that one can make uh, um, accordingly. So, but 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 I haven't I haven't written about it and I haven't seen anything written, but I think it will come. So I think you're on the right track with that question. All right, very good. Uh, so Colin Rowat also points to uh, a paper uh, that you know could be a natural bridge between social choice and uh, multi uh, multi X. Right. So that's a that's another great question. I've I've talked and I've, talk, I've spoken with Frankel about this. We don't, you know, something feels like it resonates, but we don't know yet. It's a good it, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Very good. Uh, so next uh, we've got a question by uh, Maria. Um, uh, which read, reads, uh, you mentioned a level of interaction with the algorithm enhances prediction accuracy. Does this imply that algorithm has an ability to learn from uh, user queries uh, what is uh, essential in decision making and hence add that factor to its predictions? Right, so no. So um, the level of interaction with, good. So not to my knowledge, um, I'm always puzzled by all of the results, our results and the results uh, in, the, in the statistics literature as to whether there's any real learning going on or is the whole game just kind of fixing previous errors by nudging things a little bit with no understanding whatsoever of the semantics, just looking at the numbers. So I, I think that the answer is probably no. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, right, so um, a, few, uh, a few other remarks. So there's uh, two other remarks uh, slash questions by Colin uh, Rowart. Uh, so one of them, uh, which is on the chat, not Q&A, says that the idea that members of set X may not be able to advocate for set X reminded me of Kasher and uh, Rubinstein's who is a J. Uh, it's been a long time since I read that. Um, if you say it reminds you of it, I, I, I believe you. But I can't remember the book enough at the moment to, to comment. Mm -hmm. um, all right, very good. So, uh, and yet from uh, Colin uh, uh, Roat, um, so there's this question, are small but mighty sets related to lottery ticket sets uh, a la Frankel, Carbon subsets with good, good accuracy? So I think we reckon, we, we discussed that, that uh, Jonathan Frankel and I have, have discussed it a bit, but it, it feels like it resonates, but we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. All right, and uh, another one from Richard Plant. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, do you see this ideal world towards which you might choose to map your outcomes as part of a distribution of ideals? It seems you might get a somewhat different set of ideal outcomes from asking a random sample of people. Hmm. Part of a distribution of ideals. I, 
I don't know how to get, I don't know how to sample ideal outcomes for anybody. We can sample outcomes in the real world because the real world actually happens. The whole problem with trying to build something that's indistinguishable from the ideal uh, predictor Q star, that is the predictor in the ideal world Q, uh, Q star, is that we can't sample outcomes that are drawn according to Q star because they happen in a world that isn't ours. All right, uh, very good. Um, there's there's a remark by Scott uh, Towsley uh, in the chat. Uh, from my physics background, this suggests to me, Eisenberg, that no matter how good our data or tools or algorithm, some degree of inescapable uncertainty remains. Undoubtedly. And one source of the uncertainty comes from the representation, that the representation simply may obliterate the information that's needed in order to make a prediction. And um, there's a lot to be said about this. Like one thing that we know, at least in the construction uh, from the HKRR paper is that Every time you update your predictor because you found a distinguisher or a distinguishing set, you make a big step toward P star. And therefore you can't have to have too many updates because there are only, you know, whatever your initial belief is and the truth, there are only a one over epsilon uh, squared, big steps of size epsilon squared. Now, what will happen if you're actually building a multi-calibrated predictor or an OI predictor is that you will take some steps, but you probably won't get all the way to P star. And you'll probably get stopped after a certain number of steps because your representation just isn't rich enough. And it could be that somebody would then go out and say, hey, I have, I have found a better way of representing people. And then you could incorporate that new way of representing people and take more steps toward P star. And again, you can't have to take too many because every time you take one, you make progress. So you don't ever lose the progress that you've made, but it might require sort of increasingly rich and complex representations of individuals. All right, very good. Um... Now, maybe, uh, maybe uh, as a final note, and uh, uh, following the spirit of this workshop on trustworthy uh, AI, I uh, was wondering whether you could share with the audience what you believe are, you know, maybe some of the most uh, important uh, topics going forward in the area of algorithmic uh, fairness. Okay, I think the most important from the kinds of problems that I've been thinking about is the question of how should individuals be represented to the uh, training algorithm and to the algorithm in general. So um, a given feature of an individual, a, a given feature may be much more expressive in one demographic group than in another demographic group. And so, um, and that is a, a a, a, an extreme vector for the introduction of bias. And I have no idea how to um, algorithmically consider a representation, a representation mapping or the choice of features and say, this is a good choice. I can maybe say this is a bad choice, but I don't know how to say this is a good choice. And I don't know any work that really grapples with this. And I think it's absolutely essential 